Uh, Adam Higginbotham, welcome Adam, nice to see you. Uh, you've written about um, this, the Space Challenger uh, story. Uh, we have to go back to the 28th of January 1986, uh, which was a day, as you were sitting down, we were talking about in history, there are often days that just leap out off the page that people will remember where they were or their grandparent or parent will tell you, I remember where I was, when. Can you bring us there? Tell us that you... Where what, where I was when it happened. Well, why don't we go for where you were for starters? I'd be interested. I mean, I, that's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is because my previous book was about the Chernobyl accident, yes. and uh, people would often ask me if I remembered where I was, and I didn't remember where I was when I heard about Chernobyl, mm. but I could remember exactly where I was when this happened, and really? it happened almost exactly three months earlier. Um, I was seventeen, and I was at school that day. Um, and, you know, it was a very 20th century event, so there's no mobile phones or anything. At the end of school, I went out with my friends. I didn't find out until I went home that night, and my mother told me, I can still remember how kind of shattering it was, yes, yes. that, you know, NASA, this organization that I'd thought as a kid, you know, as a space enthusiast, was capable of anything yes. and achieving the impossible, you know, had experienced this terrible catastrophe, and not only that, but done it live on television. Let's 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 fill if the shuttle and let, you know it, it, populate it, if you will, and bring the story alive for people who who don't know anything about it. Because outside America and to another generation, it's it's not that it's forgotten, but it's kind of drifted into the shadow. So so bring it alive again for us. What what, what are we talking about here? Well, it was a the it was the twenty fifth mission of the space shuttle, which was a reusable spacecraft that had been flying since nineteen eighty one, um, and it had launched all that time earlier, and kind of you know. It had really regenerated interest in, in space flight for, gen for a whole generation of Americans who'd kind of got bored of it yeah. and, and uh, lost touch with it in the wake of the Apollo moon landings. Um, and it had really come to embody a sort of revitalized America in, in President Ray after President Reagan's election to office, you know, using the slogan morning in America yeah. after all of the kind of disappointments and the setbacks of Vietnam and Watergate um, and distrust in government and economic setbacks that came with that, the shuttle really came to embody a, a resurgent America yes. and confidence in high technology. Um, and that continued to the point where uh, they launched this, the NASA launched this idea called the Space Flight Participant Program, yeah. in which space flight had become so routine that they would send ordinary civilians into space. And the first person they selected to do this was a teacher by the name of Krista McAuliffe. She was one of, of so many thousands of applicants, wasn't she? She beat out 11,000 yeah. other applicants. Amazing. And she was this kind of amazing choice for it because she was, she was incredibly smart. She was very charismatic. Mm. And she was a great salesperson mm. for the space program. So, you know, there's a scene in the book where she goes on the Johnny Carson show. And at one point in this interview, she, he, she completely charms Carson, yeah. who's like this kind of very cynical talk show presenter. But at the end, he asks her if she's concerned about, you know, the dangers of space flight because there have been close calls and things in previous flights. And she just says, oh, no, you know, I, I completely trust NASA. And, and this is a very successful and well-tested program. And then off they go. And then off they go on seven the morning of, of seven of them on the morning of, of January the 28th. Um, and because of, there was a leak in the solid rocket boosters that, that powered the shuttle into space. Uh, 73 seconds into flight, the entire space shuttle stack, as they called it, disintegrated, and the crew were all killed. You, you described that opening scene with Steve Nesbitt on, on the microphone, our commentator, if you like, um, getting his papers ready. You know, I mean, I love this. This is what I, I keep saying, is that your attention to detail is beautiful. You, you paint the scene. And he's getting it ready, going, how, how do I commentate this? It's not like a football match or something right. like that. It's a very different thing. And he's thinking about Walter Cronkite, of course, told the world about Kennedy and late, late, latterly about uh, Reagan assassination attempts. So he wanted to, ha he, he knew where we were in terms of history and broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And then the silence. Right. I mean, because the silence is, you, you write about, the si I, I, I could hear the silence in, in, your, in your reporting. It was extraordinary. I mean, the, the, I spent a lot of time with Steve, and he, you? you know, and and actually went to the to the control room where he right. was commentating yeah. to to write that. Um, but I was, you know, one of the things that that certainly Americans all all remember about that day is that that the commentator who was commentating on the launch 
described it as a major malfunction, yeah. which seems like this colossal understatement yes. and this weirdly clinical language to use about what you're watching Did on you the screen. you explain that? You explain why exactly. he was so careful. So I wanted to, one of the things I wanted to find out from Steve was, why did yeah. you say that? Yeah. And it was because... He, like everyone else in Mission Control and everyone else at Cape Canaveral, a lot of people at Cape Canaveral at the time, yeah. in the moments after it happened, nobody could believe that what had happened in front of them had happened because it was so unprecedented. Yes. You know? So it was disbelief. It was total disbelief, but yeah. also confusion. Mm -hmm. So there were the guys around him in Mission Control, all the flight controllers, were desperately searching for an explanation of what had happened, but had no idea. And so there is, as you, as you say, there's this 41 seconds of total yeah. silence as he's trying desperately to figure out what information he can give. He's going out live to millions of people. He doesn't want to make a mistake. Yeah. So he just doesn't say anything for more than half a minute. And then eventually the best he can do is to say, obviously a major malfunction. Flight controllers are looking very carefully at their data. Remarkable. And in, of course, in broadcasting terms, one second of silence is dog ears. You know, it's like well, I mean, you know, but I know. Anyway, 41 <laughs> seconds is an eternity. So it really is a long time. Yeah. And, but of course, if people are trying to process it. I mean, and you put it in that context of post-Vietnam, post-Watergate, post a kind of malaise of the Carter presidency and, and, the, and this kind of make, I mean, let's face it, Reagan was the original make America great again, wasn't he? I mean, no, that's, that's what I think before. that may be where the slogan comes from. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so it was, they were all looking at, at this, this, as you say, America resurgent and then the, the explosion. Right. Um, and I think what, what you do in your book, which is so important is you put uh, humanity to the, to the, to the expression seven astronauts. Right. Was that was that something you set out to do to kind of who are who were they? We just think seven astronauts. I, I, I left this book going. I, I I met seven people. You know. I, right. Exactly. Is, is, was that the, was that, that part was of definitely the, the idea because because you know the Challenger accident over the years since it happened. It's almost forty years ago. You know has been written about a lot, but almost every every version of that story. They, the writer tries to start like the day before the accident mm. and introduces you to these these seven astronauts. You know, right before the accident happens. Um, but it was important to me to write a version of the story where you meet them and you meet a lot of the, the managers and technicians who participate in the program and build the shuttle in the first place so that you can really appreciate what was lost in, in those 73 seconds of flight yeah. when, and why people were so taken aback, so shattered by it, and why it remains such a kind of pivotal moment in American history. I mean, One that people, you know, as you say, remember exactly where they were. Where they were. They? You, the, the fact that there was a school teacher meant that, as you point this out in your book, that meant that there were millions of school children invested in a way they mightn't have been before. Two and a half million school children were watching it live. Okay. I am still here with my uh, with my friend. Would you don't mind? We're friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my guest today, Adam Higginbotham, who's the author of Challenger, A True Story of Heroism and Disaster on the Edge of Space. A fascinating, extraordinary and exhaustively researched, and I mean that as a compliment, obviously, uh, book about the uh, space shuttle in, and in, in 1986. And we were talking about the seven astronauts and what I was going to you, you you touched on this idea of of groupthink and responsibility D does it what did you discover and how much did you could you attribute to whom about what the hell happened well the the, the groupthink thing is really rooted in in NASA's approach to risk because the the way in which they reckoned with organizing a, a space program that was built around experimental spacecraft, which all the engineers and all the astronauts understood were extremely dangerous, was they just had to limit how dangerous anything was going to be. And yeah. so they would, they would reach limits of, of what was acceptable risk. They'd analyze all the components in advance of each launch. They'd decide how likely they were to perform their role as they were supposed to. And then as soon as they got them to be safe enough, they knew that they would, could never eliminate risk completely without keeping the spacecraft on the ground then they'd give the go-ahead to launch. Um, and, but what happened is these the seals that eventually caused the accident, the seals in the solid rocket boosters, were something that weren't supposed to fail at all. They were supposed to be completely reliable on every launch. Yes. Uh, but quite early on in the, space pro in the space shuttle program, they began to discover little bits of damage in these. And, and so 
over the course of the years between 1981, when the first launch was, and 86, when Challenger happened, they began to gradually expand what they regarded as acceptable risk. Yeah. Okay. And so they ended up accepting what was you know, damage that anyone coming in from the outside would regard as extremely dangerous. Isn't that extraordinary? And I, as you're talking, I'm thinking of the unsinkable, the Titanic. You know, it's, exa- it's, it's exactly the same kind of thing. And the same with the Chernobyl accident. It's what this uh, sociologist who wrote an entire book dedicated to the decision to launch Challenger called The Normalization of Deviance. Wow, what an expression. Is, is there hubris involved? Uh, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, so, they, because as I said earlier, you know, I as a kid had got the idea, even at the age of 12, that NASA could do anything. You know, yeah. these guys with slide rules could achieve the impossible. Um, and, but they, over the years, they had begun to believe in their own infallibility too. And that's definitely what led towards this accident. And the other name that kept coming up was Icarus, uh, of course. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's exactly yeah, that. It's too exactly. close to the sun with the wax wing. What, what's the impact? What, what's, what's the takeaway from this awfulness and uh, this awful incident? What's, what's been the impact on history? I mean, we're talking 1986, so decades later. Well, I think, I mean, the, the most important um, immediate effect was the loss of that, that confidence um, in not only in, in high technology as this sort of panacea of a, of a better future, um, but also a loss of confidence in NASA. You know, overnight, people in America stopped thinking that NASA was an agency that was beyond reproach, unlike all those others that had been damaged by the years of Nixon and Vietnam and Watergate. And all, you know, NASA was the one that you could still have confidence in. Yeah. And that went away immediately. And, and was that sacred cow, if you like, was it slaughtered or just wounded? Well, I mean, people, they, because part of the research I did, you know, I read a lot of opinion polls. And one thing that was surprising was that that after the accident, people in America became even more supportive of sending people into space with NASA okay. than they were before. So they, it really, people really rallied around the organization. But in terms of that idea of, of technology being something that was going to improve the future for everyone, that really, that you know, was shattered yeah. that day and has never recovered. Okay. Uh, congratulations. You put four years of your life into this book and now you can see it on every page. Well done. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I really mean that. Uh, Challenger by Adam Higginbotham uh, is the book we've been talking about for the last few minutes. Well done. Really, it's a, it's a terrific piece of work. Thank and you. And it's been great to see you on the show today. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Radio.